Matthew 27, this is kind of the final moments of Jesus' life. And I want to just talk for a few minutes tonight about some of the amazing things that took place the moment Jesus breathed his last. But listen in, Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 45, says this. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling Elijah. And one of them ran at once and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Nobody took his life. Jesus gave his life. And watch what happened. Verse 51 says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom. Not bottom to top. From top to bottom. And the earth shook. And the rocks were split. And the tombs were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Jesus, we thank you that on that day, when you breathed your last, everything changed. And we're here to celebrate that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You guys can grab a seat wherever you are. Let's keep the lights out. This is fun. This is, uh, I feel like we're in a living room together. I like having you guys up here. This is great. I need you guys up here on the stage all the time. I love this. Um, the cross marks the darkest day in human history. If you think about it, it was the day when the creator was put to death by the people he created on a hill he created, stapled to a cross made from wood from a tree that he had spoken into existence. Wow. They gave him a black eye, but really the cross gave humanity a black eye. You know, I mean, I look back on this day and I just think, how did we get here to this moment? Jesus goes down in history as one of tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who have been put to death via capital punishment. Punished for a crime. I didn't say punished for a crime he committed, but punished for a crime. And there are many notorious people that we know of that have been killed in, in similar manner uh, via capital punishment. Timothy McVeigh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Ted Bundy. We could go down a list of well-known names of notorious criminals who died because of being convicted guilty of heinous crimes that they committed. And then there's Jesus, who also died via capital punishment, but in a divine twist turn of events, we were declared guilty and he was put to death. It's the substitution of the cross. It's a very dark, solemn day in human history. We were the guilty party Jesus went to the cross. I don't know about you, but I can remember back to seeing the news stories and following the news stories of Saddam Hussein when he was captured. And uh, I, I remember being glued to my, my, my TV set at the time. I remember calling out to Jen and telling her, you got to come see this. They've, they found him. And, and then for the next few weeks and months, watching as the, the court trials took place and he was convicted and eventually hanged. 
And of course, we heard the reports of Osama bin Laden, and you know, we, we rejoiced and we, we cheered on our, our military, and we, we, you know, there was feelings of patriotism, and we're watching these, these things take place. And I can remember where I was when those events took place, and I can remember how shocking it was, and, and even kind of a, a feeling of relief as I watched some of these men finally meet justice for what they had done. But you know what's crazy is, although I can think back on those dates and how historic those moments were, eventually, we kind of just moved on, right? Like eventually, we just, yeah, they did terrible things, and yeah, they died terrible deaths, and they got what they deserved, and then we, we watched for weeks and months, and then we kind of, at some point, went on with our lives. And so here's Jesus who died a horrific death, died a death in our place. And if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing with his death that we did with Osama bin Laden's death. And we'll just go on with life. A criminal on a cross by a couple other criminals, you might think. Capital punishment, punished like all of these other people. That's what all the passers-by would have said as they saw this, this, this happen on this day. And, and yet, we're here tonight, people joining us from all over the world right now on our live stream, people in overflow right now joining us right now, because what we want to do is hit pause and say, no, we're never going to just move on. We're, we're never just going to go on with our lives like this didn't actually happen. I want to share a message with you just in these next few moments that I'm calling shockwaves. Because the reality is when Jesus died, everything changed. It immediately sent shockwaves. Not only literal, physical, geological shockwaves, we'll talk about that, but even through the heavens, everything changed. In fact, because of Jesus' death, life can never be the same for any of us. And, and as I see in Matthew chapter 27, I want to just share four quick things that have amazing reverberating repercussions for us in our lives 2,000 years later as we celebrate Jesus on the cross. And tonight, of course, if you're, with, if you're here with us in person, we get to celebrate communion together. At the end, we're going to do that. And I hope that as we journey just in these next few moments through these verses in Matthew 27, that the scripture brings even some new life to the act of communion. Four things that happen because of Jesus' death. The first is this. Number one, Jesus opened the unapproachable. It says in verse 51 that, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, if you're new to church or you're new kind of to the story, it may not seem like that big of a deal. Like, why did that even get into the Bible that there was a curtain that got ripped, right? Like, you might think, well, we've got kids and we ripped a curtain the other day and I didn't write a book about it. So what's the big deal about a curtain, you know? Well, this is more than just a curtain. This was more than just something that you, you block out some light or that decorates your home. This was, uh, th this was a division in the temple. Actually, a very important division in the temple. Up until Jesus' death, this curtain had been, had been put there by God. God wanted this, this curtain to be there in the temple because it divided in very, a couple very important areas in the temple. Mainly, it protected all of humans, any humans that would go into the temple. It protected them from the dangerous presence of God. In fact, the presence of God was only accessible to one person, the high priest, once a year. And that was only after ritual, bless, uh, ritual baths and ritual washings and, and different ceremonies he had to go through. And once a year, he could go into the place, the Holy of Holies, and meet with the presence of God. Only one person could. And, and on this day, as Jesus exhaled for the last time, that curtain, it didn't rip from the bottom up, I want you to notice. It ripped from the top down as though God did it. God made a way. It wasn't man standing at the bottom tearing the curtain. It was God 
tearing the curtain and saying, come into my presence, right? He made himself available as, as Jesus breathed his last. And just in case you're wondering what this curtain was like, this was, again, not just our, our, our you know, six foot tall pipe and drape, okay? This is not just a curtain that you hang on your window. Uh, this was estimates say about 30 feet wide and about 60 feet tall at the time of Jesus. So for some perspective, if you're here with us in person, from this back wall to the back wall back here is about 46 feet. So if you took that curtain and you laid it down, it would cover up this entire room and 14 more feet. And Josephus, who is an extra biblical historical writer, said at the time of Jesus, the curtain most likely was about four inches thick. This was not just a curtain. You couldn't just rip the curtain. God ripped the curtain as Jesus breathed his last because what Jesus died to do was open the unapproachable presence of God. He wanted us to be able to go and, and be with him. And so now the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that we should approach the throne of grace with confidence. This is an amazing thing because I want you to know that pre-Jesus' death, you couldn't do that. As much as you might have wanted to, as much as any of the Jews might have wanted to go into the presence of God, you just you couldn't do it. You would be struck dead. It was too, it was too dangerous. God dwelt in unapproachable light. And so on this day, then, all of that changed. Hebrews 4 says, approach the throne of grace with confidence and know that you can receive the mercy and grace that you need in your, in your time of need. That's, that's incredible. And, and, and it's amazing because now the presence of God is open to anyone, anywhere, at any time. In fact, every single thing in your life is now less accessible than the very presence of God. Think about that. Your home, your car, and we lock everything up, don't we? We got, we got video doorbells. We have keypads to keep people out. Our, your iPhone probably has like finger ID, touch, face recognition, right? I, I mean, e everything in our life is secure and locked up to keep people out. God says, I don't need, I don't need face IDs. I don't need fingerprints. You, 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 everybody's welcome. Anytime, anywhere, anyone, come on in, right? Jesus breathed his last, and that curtain ripped from top to bottom. God said, come on in. Everybody's welcome. He opened up the unapproachable. Second thing he did was Jesus' death broke the unbreakable. Did you see this in, at the end of verse 51? It says, the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now, this kind of blew my mind as I, as I studied uh, this this week because as Jesus exhaled for the final time, it seems that this shockwave kind of went out from the cross. This earthquake took place and the rocks split open. Think about this for a moment. Think about the significance of this moment. Think about these rocks. There were rocks that split open on that day that had been there since the flood. And Jesus' death split them wide open. You know what blew my mind this week? I had in my mind, fresh from teaching on Sunday, this story of Jesus riding in five days prior into Jerusalem. I had this fresh on my mind as I was studying this week. And so I remembered the scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem and the Pharisees trying to quiet the worship that was happening all around him. And Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. And do you remember what he told them? He said, if they're quiet, what would happen? The rocks would cry out. Come on, did you see what happened at the cross? Jesus breathed his last, and guess what happened? The, the worship fell silent, and what happened? The rocks cried out. At the, at the very death of Jesus, the rocks split open. If nobody else is going to worship, the rocks said, oh, we will. And so the rocks split the very hardest, the unbreakable things split. And the irony kind of, of of this scene is that the rocks were more tender than a lot of the human hearts that were there. They split while the hardened heart of men 
killed God that day. And so I, I think it's important that we would ask ourselves, have we allowed our hearts to become so hard that it's no longer broken by our sin? Have we allowed our hearts to become so hardened in our sin that it's going to take a miracle to break us? And God can certainly do it, but Jesus' death broke these, these stones. And so I think this is the, the perfect time for us to ask, is my heart broken over what I've done to Jesus? Because it wasn't just a Roman soldier that killed Jesus, it was you and I. Is that, has that broken your heart? Have you let that sink in? Here's the third thing that happened with Jesus. Jesus' death overcame what was unconquerable. So verse 52, this has always intrigued me. The tombs also were opened. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And by the way, I love this. I'm talking a little bit about this on Sunday. I love that so often in the New Testament, the Bible refers to the death of the saints as sleeping. It's just a temporary nap, right? They, were fallen, they had fallen asleep. They were raised. Now watch this. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, so Matthew kind of looks ahead a few days, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I remember when I read this uh, sometime over the last year, I thought, I got to teach that for Good Friday because I got to take some time and learn exactly what's happening right here. What a, what a crazy scene. I, I almost called the message tonight in light of this verse, the night of the living dead. But then I thought you would start thinking like The Walking Dead and I Am Legend. And I thought I want to like get those, those zombie images out of your mind. Because that's, that's not at all really what was happening here. I don't want you, if you're picturing like mummies and zombies coming, that's not what was happening. This is not the scene. This is the, the saints. These are, 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 are people who had fallen. It says the bodies of the saints they had fallen asleep and they were raised, okay? Now, we don't have a lot of details here. This is, Matthew's the only one who recounts this, and this is the only two verses that he talks about it. So we don't know much about it, but the language seems to suggest they were not just resuscitated, but they were literally resurrected with a new resurrection body, meaning that they were healed from whatever it was that caused them to die, and then at some point, maybe around the ascension of Christ a few days later, they would have been taken up into heaven as well. But, but it, was a, it was quite the scene. You know, I've, I've done plenty of funerals, and I've yet to see any resurrections. So this would be quite the scene. You know, I was trying to put myself in the shoes of some of these people who would have been witnessing this. And I just, I can't imagine. Like, it says that these were saints, so... We don't know exactly who they were. They could have been people who died very recently, right? maybe right before Jesus, maybe days or weeks or months prior to Jesus. It could have been people who maybe their family was still in mourning for them. And then they just showed back up for Easter dinner, you know, like <laughs> imagine that. And it's not just a mummy. It's not a zombie. They're healed and they're sitting at the table eating. They walked back into their life. Or, or it, it might have been somebody who died recently, or it says that they were the saints, so it could have been David. It could have been Abraham. It could have been Daniel. Can you, can you imagine the scene as these men of renown, these, these godly maybe men and women were resurrected and went back in? It, it's, it, it was almost like Jesus was immediately sending a message that death had forever been conquered. Everything changed when Jesus died that day. The tombs were opened. And, and so the, the thing that was unconquerable, the thing that couldn't happen, happened right there on that day. And again, we don't exactly know who these, these people are, but, but here's the bigger deal. The resurrections were great, but really the bigger deal was that this gave us a foretaste of our future. Because it wasn't just the miracle of a few, and we don't know how many. Maybe it's, maybe it's just a handful, maybe a few dozen, maybe a few hundred. But it, it's not really so much just the focus on the resurrections, but even the foretaste of what that meant for all of us. 
Because think about this. If tombs can be opened and dead people resurrected, something has changed, right? Something's very different. And, and, and I, I think of, I, I think of uh, immediately what came to mind was when Paul said that one day the dead in Christ will rise. So for any of us, when Jesus returns, it says that the dead in Christ will rise and we get to meet Christ in the air. It's just a, a, a pretty amazing thought. But just the thought of the resurrection is kind of a mind-blowing thing because if you think about it, death for us as humans is the most permanent thing that we know. Almost everything else in life can be undone in some way. You can kind of go back and redo some things or undo something or, or, or whatever it might be, but death is final. Like, that's it. Funerals speak of finality. When you go to the funeral and, and you close the casket, like, that's it. There is, there's, there's no more on, on earth. That's it. That's the final glance at that family member or friend. That's, that's, it's final. That's what the funeral is all about. But Jesus took the thing that was the most, most final and most permanent, and he made it no longer permanent. The dead in Christ will rise. Jesus conquered what was unconquerable that day he overcame. it. Here's a fourth thing that happened. Jesus' death saved the unsavable. Verse 54 says, when the centurion and those who were with him uh, keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and they said, truly, this was the son of God. Now, this is not, just so we're clear, this is not just another bystander. There were lots of bystanders. Um, in fact, the, the, the way that the Romans did crucifixion was they did it purposely very publicly to teach everybody a lesson that was kind of the whole point public humiliation this was not done privately or humanely like capital punishment is carried out today today there are laws and rules and a place to do it and only some people can ever see it uh you, you know they're, they're there are so many regulations around it today not in jesus's day the cross was meant to humiliate the criminal. And they were publicly put on display on a hill so that everybody could see, so that everybody could, could, could watch. And so here's a few of the bystanders, and one of them that Matthew singles out is a centurion. Now, for context, a Roman centurion, this was just like another day on the job. This was another Friday. He had, he had seen this hundreds of times over. Like, this was the guy's job, if you could imagine that. He was an executioner. That's, that's what he did. So his job was to oversee and approve of this kind of thing and made sure that it ran smoothly, and then it was as publicly humiliating as possible. That was kind of like his job. He, he would sometimes whip the prisoner. He would beat them. They would mock them. And, and they were hardened soldiers that were known to show no mercy. So this was a big deal that the Roman centurion saw this. And I, and I wonder how he came to this realization. I'm thinking it probably had something to do with Jesus' calmness through all of this. Coupled with these cataclysmic events that began to took, take place. And as, as the sky went dark for three hours... And Jesus' body went limp on the cross, and the ground shook. The Roman centurion goes, that was not just another criminal. That was, he says, that was truly, this was the Son of God. And so the Jews were mocking and walking by, and the soldiers were mocking and shouting and taunting at Jesus. And then the rock split and the dead rose. The tombs were opened. And here's a soldier standing there in awe. And, and, and by the way, this would have been a blow to the Jews to read this. What the Jews, God's chosen people missed, the Roman centurion, the hardened soldier, saw and proclaimed that day. This was maybe for this man, 
a day of salvation. As he, as he simply just cried out. And, but I think even more significant than the Roman soldier crying out that day is again the salvation that this act foreshadowed. Because again, this was not just a local thing that took place. This, the shock waves that went out from the cross that day echo throughout all of eternity, uh, even today. We're different because of the shock waves that happened uh, from, from the cross that day. So even on the screen, and I know on the stage you can't see this, but on the screen, you'll notice that it says Jesus' death saved, and the word unsavable is in quotations. I put that because unsavable, it turns out, isn't really even a word. You know, it's funny about this. I found this out because as I typed it, my computer underlined it with that red squiggly line. You know what I'm talking about? Like, hey, you spelled something wrong here. And so I was like, oh, I, unsavable. Did I spell it wrong? And then I was looking at it. I was like, no, I'm pretty sure that's how you spell unsavable. So I right-clicked, like I'm going to look it up in the dictionary. Dictionary. It's not even in the dictionary. Unsavable is not in there. And I thought, you know what? That's a word not in God's dictionary either. There's no such thing as unsavable, right? Like nobody is beyond the reach of the cross. I'm thinking if a hardened Roman soldier who did this for his job could get it, then there's hope for any of us. He saved on that day the unsavable. And so if there's hope for this centurion, if there's hope for anybody, there's hope for all of us. We have to be reminded that on this day, every, everything changed. There's hope for the Hindu. There's hope for the Muslim. There's hope for the atheist, the agnostic, the alcoholic, the adulterer. How many do I need to go down the list and, and just remind you? Because listen, the picture of the cross, we will forever stand in the shadow of the cross. And the picture of the cross with Jesus' arms wide open says, come anybody's welcome, right? The, the cross with Jesus's arms spread wide reminds us that there's nobody who isn't allowed into the very presence of God. The cross reminds us of the access that we have to God. He saved the unsavable and he opened, opened it up for all of us.